Well, I don't care what Elon Musk named his baby Gavin. I'm not calling you AEX, whatever the hell. <laughs> Ass. The following podcast contains. Man, you have got to teach me some of those old man swear words. Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you tweeted about your coup hours before starting your coup, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is a Friday, May 8th, 2020. Next time, maybe try rolling the Thompson Gunner edition of the show, where we talk about America's problem finding good help these days. Stay tuned. The What the Hell Are You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Bob's Budget Black Ops. Are you an intelligence agency on a budget looking to keep costs down on a covert op? Look no further than Bob's Budget Black Ops. Our mercenaries are good, but they are cheap. Unlike other mercenary agencies, we don't have high overhead on former spec ops troops like Green Berets or Navy SEALs. Our mercenaries are former finance clerks, supply sergeants, or guys from the motor pool who haven't fired a weapon since basic. But they were definitely in the military sometime within the past 30 years. Looking for something with a little more firepower? Our militia package package features fat, middle-aged white guys wearing camo and carrying an AR-15 when they go to Walmart. They are good, but they are motivated. So if you're on a budget and need to overthrow a South American country anyway, call Bob Budget Black Ops. Our guys, well, they're expendable. Ten years ago, a crack commando unit was sent to prison by a military court for a crime they didn't commit. These men promptly escaped from maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A-Team. Just one... Of the myriad lies one is told when enlisting as a military is how your enlisting will teach you valuable job skills with which you could find employment in civilian life. What they don't tell you is how you need to... You read the entire terms and conditions! Because it turns out there's a limited civilian market for, say, being a mechanic on an N1 Abrams tank, a sonar operator, or knowing how to decontaminate a battlefield after a nerve gas attack. Even if you have a decade of highly specialized experience directly transferable to a job, it turns out many, if not all, employers don't care. They want you to attend their training and start from the bottom and work your way back up. Like, say, a federal agency that used the very exact same training because I know, because I went to school with them, that I held multiple certifications in who told me that not only would I need to repeat all that exact same training, but I would need to work for them a minimum of five years to even be considered for the same position I had just spent 10 years doing. And if you're a grunt, like an army or a marine grunt, then... You people are all shit out of luck. Because your training and experience qualify you for working the drive through at Wendy's or being a prison guard, as both these positions require an intimate knowledge of how to kill people and blow up their shit, particularly Wendy's. They prize those skills as deeply important to their corporate vision. You know it's real. So it's no wonder that a few gruts consider entering the world of private security for hire. Not work in the door at the Boom Boom Room in Tampa, Florida, but private professional soldiering. Mercenary soldiers go where the money is! Oh, they have a different name for it nowadays. Private military contractor, but it's mercenary work, plain and simple. Hell, even I thought about doing it a couple of times after 9-11, heading over to Iraq and pushing a bomb dog for 100 grand a year tax-free, but I decided that dying wasn't worth the money. And for a brief moment, after I left the military... I thought about going to the black side of the business and working for the drug cartels. You see, I figured if my dog could find the, couldn't find the load before it went across the borders, then neither could customs dogs. But then I thought the first load that I'd cleared and got busted would be the last load that I cleared and then got busted and ending my days as a cartel mercenary. And so again, dying not being worth the payout, I went a different path. 
To be fair, there is a difference between private military contracted and genuine mercenary work, and that kind of difference is what kind of shit you're doing. PMCs work in hostile environments doing things like guarding convoys, securing remote work sites, or personal protection for VIPs. Mercenaries do shit like plot coups, overthrow governments, recruit and train people to overthrow governments, and sometimes get caught by the governments they were looking to overthrow. That can't be good. Not if you're one of the mercenaries, no. Which brings us to a story that you probably missed, what with the world ending at all, which, in which two former soldiers employed by the U United States private military contractor were caught earlier this week trying to stage a coup in Venezuela. The story I'm about to tell you is ridiculous in every facet, and every bit is as complicated as it is stupid. So I'm going to try to distill it down to the basics, starting with how it predictably ended. From The Guardian on May 5th, quote, Venezuela's authorities have detained two U.S. citizens allegedly working with a U.S. military veteran who has claimed responsibility for a failed armed incursion into the oil-producing country of Venezuela, unquote. Maduro, the president of Venezuela, went on to claim the clue was U.S.-backed attempt to overthrow him and was foiled by his security forces. Seems simple, but I assure you the story is not, because this coup has all the elements of a poorly written movie spoof and i can only assume that as the plotters approached the beach in venezuela they were not coming to ride the valkyries so much as they were yakety sacks the associated press dropped an exclusive story on may 1st four days before the actual coup took place about the plotters oh fuck this is so stupid yeah literally Four days before the coup started, before they were captured, there was a story in Associated Press, which from an OPSEC standpoint was probably not ideal. Quote, This bizarre, untold story of a call to arms that crashed before it launched is drawn from the interviews with more than 30 Maduro opponents, opponents and aspiring freedom fighters who were directly involved in or familiar with its planning. When hints of the conspiracy surfaced last month, the Maduro-controlled state media portrayed it as an invasion ginned up by the CIA like the Bay of Pigs fiasco in 1961. An Associated Press investigation found no evidence of the U.S. government involvement in the plot. Nevertheless, interviewers revealed that leaders of the Venezuela's U.S.-backed opposition knew of its covert force, even if they dismissed its prospects. Planning for the incursion began after April 30th of 2019 when the barracks revolt by a cadre of soldiers who swore a loyalty to Maduro's would-be replacement Juan Guaido. The opposition leaders recognized by the U.S. and some 60 other nations as Venezuela's rightful leader. A few weeks later, some soldiers and politicians involved in the failed rebellion retreated to the JW Marriott in Bogota, Colombia. The hotel was a center of intrigue among Venezuelan exile exiles. For this occasion, conference rooms were reserved for what one participant described as a Star Wars summit of anti-Maduro goofballs. Military deserters accused of drug trafficking, shady financiers, and former Maduro, Maduro officials seeking redemption. Unquote. Yeah, the coup to overthrow the government of Venezuela started in the lobby of a Marriott like a regional sales conference for Sparky's Tire Distributors out of Omaha. Continuing from the AP, quote, Among those angling in the open lobby was Jordan Godreau, an American citizen and three-time Bronze Star recipient for bravery in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he served as a medic in the U.S. Army Special Forces. Those he interacted with, with in the U.S. and Colombia described him in interviews as alternate as a freedom-loving patriot, a mercenary, and a gifted warrior scarred by battle and way in over his head. At the end of an otherwise distinguished military career, the Canadian-born Goudreau investigated, was investigated in 2013 for allegedly defrauding the army of $62,000 in housing stipend. Goudreau said the investigation was closed with no charges. In 2018, he set up Silver Core USA, a private security firm near his home on Florida's Space Coast, to embed counter-terror agents in schools disguised as teachers. The company's website features photos and videos of Goudreau firing machine guns in battle, running shirtless up a pyramid, flying on a private jet, and sporting a military backpack with a rolled up American flag, unquote. Oh, it's not crazy at all. What transpired from there was a concert on the Colombia-Venezuela border put on by Richard Branson, a virgin for some reason. At that concert, <laughs> Goudreau met with Keith Schiller, Trump's longtime personal bodyguard and former White House staffer and current head of the security 
for the Republican National Committee. It's all connected. Yeah, no, that would be too easy. According to the AP, quote, last May, Gaudreau accompanied Schiller to a meeting in Miami with representatives of Guido. There was a lively discussion with Schiller about the need to beef up security for Guido and his growing a growing team of advisors inside Venezuela and across the world. According to a person familiar with the meeting, Schiller thought Gaudreau was naive and in over his head. He cut off all contact following the meeting, said a person close to the former White House official, unquote. At that same meeting in Miami with, with Goudreau, he also met Cliver Acala, quote, a retired major general in the Venezuelan army who seemed like an unlikely hero to restore democracy to his homeland. In 2011, he was sanctioned by the, US, the United States for allegedly supplying FARC rebels in Colombia with surface-to-air missiles in exchange for cocaine. And last month, <laughs> Alcala was indicted by the U.S. prosecutor alongside Maduro as one of the architects of a narco-terrorist conspiracy that allegedly sent 250 metric tons of cocaine every year into the United States. Alcala, by the way, is currently in jail in the United States on those drug trafficking charges. Together, Goudreau and Akala began to flash out the details of what would become Operation Gideon, the code name for the recently failed coup attempt. A former Navy SEAL contra contracted to teach the rebels battlefield first aid said, quote, he was surprised by the barren conditions. There was no running water. And the men were sleeping on the floors, skipping meals and training with sawed off broomsticks in place of assault rifles. Five Belgian shepherds trained to sniff out explosives were as poorly fed as their handlers and had to be given away. Matos, the Navy SEAL, said, he grew weary as the men recalled how Gaudreau had boasted to them having protected Trump and told them he was ready in a shipment of weapons and arranging aerial support for an adventurous assault of Maduro's compound, unquote. I knew it. I knew it. Again, quote, the AP found no indications U.S. officials sponsored Gaudreau's actions, nor that Trump authorized covert operations against Maduro, something that requires con a congressional notification. When the Colombians checked with their CIA counterparts in Bogota, they were told that the former Green Beret was never an agent. Alcala was then told by his host to stop talking about an invasion or face expulsion. The former Colombian official said, It's unclear where Alcala and Goudreau got their backing, and whatever money was collected for the initiative appears to have been meager. One person alleged to have promised support was Rowan Kraft, an eccentric descendant of the cheese-making Kraft family. We wouldn't have to eat Kraft dinner. But we would eat Kraft dinner. Of course we would. We just eat more. So, we have the sign of Kraft fucking cheese funding a coup with a drug-dealing exile general planned by a former Green Beret, widely considered brave, but not super bright when it comes to things like plotting coups. Their troops were 300 starving, untrained bozos in a jungle camp of Colombia, and the plan so poorly conceived that even the Trump administration didn't want to have anything to do with it. Let me just wrap up the AP article, quote, the plot quickly crumbled in early March when one of the volunteer combatants was arrested after sneaking across the border into Venezuela from Colombia. Shortly after, Colombian police stopped a truck transporting a cache of brand new weapons and tactical equipment, around $150,000 worth, including spotting scopes, night vision goggles, two-way radios, and 26 American-made assault rifles with serial numbers rubbed off. Alcala claimed ownership of the weapons shortly before surrendering to face the U.S. drug charges, saying they belonged to the Venezuelan people, unquote. Alcala surrendered to the U.S. on drug trafficking charges. The plot ostensibly ended, and the government of Venezuela enjoyed a good goofing on the whole stupid fucking thing. Everyone thought it was over until Monday, May 4th, when the Venezuelan Navy stopped a boat full of men and weapons, including, and I kid you not, an airsoft pellet rifle trying to sneak into Venezuela. Included in the 62 men stopped were two U.S. citizens and former Army Special Forces soldiers Aaron Barry and Luke Denman, self-identified mercenaries working for Gaudreau. Now look. I'm legitimately concerned for the fate of these two men, veterans, American, and human beings with families that love them. I hope they're treated well and come home soon. 
But come on. Shayna, they bought their tickets. They knew what they were getting into. I say, let them crash. They voluntarily signed up to overthrow the government of a sovereign nation for money. They weren't patriots fighting for a cause. They were mercenaries fighting for cash. And they had to know this entire plan was completely foobar. They had to know the thing was compromised and had been for months. And finally, they had to know that the guy planning all this had no fucking clue what the fuck he was doing. Dude wasn't even an officer. He was a fucking sergeant first class, a fucking E7. E7s don't do strategic planning on this scale. They're tactical operators, small unit tactics and active operations. And he's probably very skilled at that and very brave, and I'm sure he is, but sergeant first classes do not plan and implement major strategic operations like that. That's a fucking colonel's job. So maybe these guys aren't too bright themselves. I don't know, but if my lowly E4 ass was in this situation, I would have had some questions if I found out the guy responsible for planning and implementing a fucking coup had never led anything larger than a fucking platoon. But that's me. I was in the fucking Air Force. I mean, how stupid was all of this? Well, there was this from a little website called Twitter. Quote, Strike Force Incursion in Venezuela. 60 villain Venezuelans, two American ex-Green Berets, at real Donald Trump. Silver Core USA, at Silver Core USA, May 4th, 2020. They tweeted about the operation while the operation was in fucking progress. The fuck? The fuck? What, what the, the f- How does that go down? Does your social manager for a mercenary company with an active and highly illegal operation and project want to brush up on your brand image a little so he tweets about it? You got, you got guys in the fucking field and you're going for retweets and you at the fucking president of the United States who is admittedly a fucking moron, but even he wouldn't. No, check that. He absolutely would. He just hasn't yet. There's no evidence that this government of the United States had anything to do with this clusterfuck. The AP reported how the CIA told the plotters to knock it off before it ever got started. I don't believe the CIA or DOD had anything to do with this goat fuck of an op. Not the modern CIA. The 50 CIA, totally, but not today. They've been burned too many times. Nor do I think the White House freelanced this thing, not because they wouldn't, but rather as fucked up as it was, it was still several rings above the kind of performance I would expect from Ken Dahl Kushner's and his boy Blunders. They would have had helicopters playing yakety sacks when they came in over the beaches. Do I think it's plausible that some dipshit Trump toady would have their fingers in it to impress their dim bulb of a boss? Chillingly plausibly indeed. But I don't think he knew about it because if he had, then he, Trump, would have tweeted about it first. All of that being said, it's not like the U.S. has a great track record with Latin American coups. I mean, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, a man I wouldn't trust to tell me if rain was wet, said this. Uh, Would you be able to tell us, or does the U.S. know who may have initiated or bankrolled this operation in Venezuela from over the weekend? And has the State Department started engaging the Maduro regime about the two Americans who are reportedly in custody there? So your first question, uh, as I think the Secretary of Defense said, or maybe it was the Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff and the President, too, there was no U.S. government uh, direct involvement in this operation. Uh, if we'd have been involved, it would have gone differently. I mean, Mike kind of glossed over some of our less exciting endeavors, small incidents like, I don't know, the Bay of Pigs, where Cuban exiles supported by the CIA and flying U.S. secondhand World War II bombers tried to invade Cuba only to fail spectacularly and very public. And even when our coups did succeed, it rarely worked out for the actual people of the country we had helped to liberate. See, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay, all of whom experienced U.S.-supported coups because, you know, communism, and endured decades of totalitarian rule, dictatorial regimes, and bloody civil wars thanks to our help. Around the world, the Washington Post reports that U.S. governments engaged in the polite term of regime change 72 times during the Cold War, and 40 of those operations failed 
which is a pretty shitty record for supposed superpower. I mean, some of those guys we put in power, we had to actually later send in troops to remove. Does Panama ring a bell with anyone? Of course it doesn't, because Americans merely remember the time we sent people in harm's way to unfuck a situation we fucked. Unless we wind up spending a couple of decades trying to put the country we broke back together again. Oh, yeah, we did that. Us and the Brits. We helped Saddam Hussein's bath party seize power in 1963. We're sorry. Our bad. Thank you. That is all. So we probably shouldn't be bragging about how good we are at cooing because even when we are good, we are still the baddies. And it's pretty clear that this will be a small and silly story in the midst of a global crisis that is probably the best for everyone. Money will be paid to Maduro and the Americans will come home quietly in a few weeks or months. And the villain Venezuelans involved who got captured? I'm sorry, who? Yeah, exactly. They've already been forgotten and will quickly be disappeared because that's what happens to people who believe Americans when we say we're here to help. So uh, maybe not the best outcome for them. Anyway, nothing will be learned, no one cares, and no one will remember it in three or four days. And the only reason I'm telling you is because, you know, I found the story amusing and distracting, and two, because I think I can turn it into a learning experience for some of my brothers and sisters leaving the service. Because I know it's frustrating for you to learn how little your time in the service actually means in the civilian world, and how badly you got fucked by your recruiter yet again. But no matter what, don't become a mercenary. It just isn't going to be anywhere near as fun as you think it will be. At best, you're guarding an oil well in Oman, and at worst, you're going to ride in a little boat into a hostile country with a pellet gun led by an ex-sergeant first class with delusions of grandeur and possible traumatic brain injury. And no matter what the stripper from the lamplighter tells you about her friends over in Juarez, They are not interested in your brilliant idea of defeating customs drug dogs by pre-sweeping the drug load with your trained drug dog. They just want to bribe you to let them know the best time to cross without being checked by customs. And they aren't even that generous with the bribes. That's, uh, that's what I heard anyway. That is it for our show this week. (laughs) Thank you all for tuning in for another largely coronavirus-free week on the show. We're dedicated to finding things to talk about that that do not remind you of how much things suck right now. When I was thrilled to find the story, not because it was a good story, because it was clearly bad for everyone, but because I knew it would make another week without dwelling on the unavoidable. Speaking of dwelling on the unavoidable, rate and review this show wherever you get your pods, and that will help other people face the unavoidable question of... Why did I just do that? Only to realize there are no good answers. Follow the show on Twitter at the Hell underscore podcast or the show name on Facebook and all kinds of cool stuff for at whatthehellpodcast.com. So for me, Dave, of all the Thompson Gunners, he was the best Bledsoe, producer, son of a bitch, Vano and Gavin, and all the fictional headless Thompson Gunners on this show. We want to say for days and nights, we battle the band to, to their knees. We kill to earn our living and to help out the Congolese. We'll see you all next week.
I have no ending for this, so I take a small bow. 